Hello, I'm looking forward to introducing you to Piaget, an amazing cognitive developmental psychologist who put together a four-stage theory of cognitive development that helped to shape the way that developmental psychology uh, has started. First, I'll introduce you a little bit to his philosophy. Then I'll introduce you to the first of his four stages, the sensory motor stage, which itself is comprised up of six substages. And then I'll share with you some of the critiques of Piaget, because while we introduce an incredible theory, in several ways we've gone beyond it at this point. First, to set the stage, Piaget felt that both nature and nurture played an important role in a child's development. That nature set the stage for what was possible, and that nurture then determined the level of achievement that that child um, met or, or accomplished in that particular stage. In addition, Piaget saw the child as an active learner, constructing his or her reality based upon experience and the current cognitive stage the child was in. This is in contrast, for example, to the behavioral psychologists uh, who felt that the environment essentially determined everything about a person that through rewards and punishments that they can make a person into anything uh, that they wanted to. Piaget, in a very different approach, said that your biology helped determine what was possible and that the child, him or herself, was an active learner within that environment, choosing what to explore. Okay, so let's start by breaking Piaget's first stage of sensory motor into those six substages. The first of those substages is referred to as simple reflexes. And the idea is that the child is born into the world with several different schemas, that is, uh, basic concepts, um, that help the child to interact with the world successfully. And uh, three of those uh, schemas would be, uh, which we also refer to as reflexes, would be rooting, uh, sucking and head withdrawal and I mention these because all those would be important to the child's survival in terms of getting food. Uh, rooting, if you uh, just stimulate the child lightly on his or her uh, cheek, uh, the child will turn in that direction and that's important and open the mouth. And that's important to then get the child uh, to start breastfeeding. The sucking is that once uh, the child uh, sucks on the milk, the child then needs to swallow that milk to get it into the stomach uh, to continue to process it. Head withdrawal. If during the nursing process a child is not getting enough oxygen, the child will automatically uh, withdraw his or her head. Again, important uh, for staying alive. So breathing, swallowing, also important reflexes. These are all things that you don't have time to learn. You have to come into the world, if you will, already knowing. And so Piaget sees this first substage, uh, simple reflexes lasting from zero to one month. And Piaget sees almost all activity uh, essentially based upon reflexes. That learning is, is not going to be taking place. The child is, if you will, reflex driven. Interesting, just as an aside note, uh, as a child is transitioning from these basic reflexes to voluntary behaviors, there's also uh, development that's taking place within the brain. Within the brain, there is a motor cortex uh, where uh, commands go out to uh, the arms, the legs, the mouth uh, for movement, a sensory cortex where information comes in uh, to the brain and is processed. And in fact, if you were doing uh, brain surgery and you used uh, uh, a device to electrically stimulate, for example, the arm part of the sensory uh, cortex, the person actually feels something on their arm. Or if you used uh, a device to electrically stimulate um, in the motor cortex, uh, the person's uh, foot, uh, they would actually uh, twitch their foot. So this area of the brain, the motor, and the sensory cortex are developing, and that's going to be important so that that child can move from uh, simple reflexes to actual voluntary control. Uh, not a part of Piaget's theory, but just kind of letting you know what's taking place biologically at that time. Uh, if a child is born without the cerebral cortex, which includes this uh, motor and, and sensory uh, cortex, if a child is born without it, the child will display those simple reflexes, but will actually never move beyond them. 
Okay, substage two, primary circular reactions. And so this is uh, from ages one to four months. And what's taking place is it's involving the infant's body. So when I say primary, I mean the infant's body. It's circular because what happens is you have a, a random motor activity. Uh, Random motor activity might be putting the hand in, in the mouth. And this creates a sensation. Oh, hand in the mouth, and infant sucks on it, it's motor activity, and enjoys that sensation. So the infant repeats uh, the motor activity to experience more of the sensation. And so the infant is reacting to this sensation. So we have a, a motor activity that involves the body, so that's the primary. The uh, infant experiences sensation and then repeats the motor activity, so that's circular. And the infant is essentially reacting to these sensations. It wasn't a planned uh, thought. The infant didn't say, I shall put my hand in my mouth to see what happens. Rather, it was a random experience as the infant's learning to gain control over his or her body, and the infant's responding. So we have a primary circular reaction, and we're focusing on the infant learning more about how to operate his or her body. You know, imagine if you were put into a crane, one of those giant cranes used to uh, create uh, um, uh, build buildings, right? And you have no con no concept of how these different controls work. Uh, you know, imagine you, you push a button here and the, the, the crane starts to move and you had no idea the crane was going to move in that particular direction. But perhaps you like that. Maybe that was, was interesting. So you go ahead and you, you push the button again and, and it moves once more. Uh, just as the infant's learning about his or her body, in this situation, you'd be learning about the crane. How does this work? I, I've never done this before. Okay, then we have uh, secondary circular reactions, and at this point the infant's at the third substage uh, from ages four to eight months, and that focus shifts to the outside world. So, whereas before the infant was learning about his or her body, now the infant's uh, working uh, to explore the world around him or her, and so instead of just like putting the hand into the mouth, which would be involving the body, uh, the infant now is uh, finding, for example, a, a rattle. Mom or dad puts the rattle on the infant's hand. The infant shakes it, right? So that shaking uh, is a motor activity. Infant has no idea what's going to happen, no sense of ability to predict, just simply does. There is a sensation, the sound of that shaking. The infant likes it, so we have a circular reaction. It's reacting to that sound and repeats the motor activity. So you with your crane, you've been moving the crane around. Uh, it's been cool, it's been fun, and, and now you're actually starting to like pick up some blocks with the crane. And hey, this is pretty neat, and, and, and you try it, try it again, right? But the key thing here is the infant isn't predicting what's going to happen from the motor activity. It's so, essentially discovering things by accident, liking it, and then repeating it. An important thing that's happening during this third uh, substage of the secondary circular reaction as the infant's learning about the world is the infant's also uh, going to be able to achieve object permanence, an important concept. If you don't have object permanence, then essentially out of sight, out of mind. If you have object permanence, even if it's not in sight, you're still thinking about it. Well, take a look at this picture of an infant uh, that has not yet demonstrated object permanence. The infant's looking at this blue monkey, totally intent upon it, right? And then the researcher puts a white cardboard between the infant and the blue monkey, and that infant just loses all interest and looks away. They does he know what was interesting there. Now, if that was a nine-month-old, that nine-month-old would whack that piece of white cardboard away and go back for the blue monkey, right? But prior to this stage, uh, not interested. And you know, as a parent, when you have keys uh, and you want it, you have an infant that's kind of a little grouchy, and you give the infant the keys to play with, they're all happy. And then when you're done, you take the keys away. You know, six months, maybe seven months, ah, that's fine. They don't mind. They go off and do something else. But around eight months, uh, if not a little bit sooner or a little bit after, the infant achieves object permanence. So at that point, if you try to take away those keys, they will cry. Right? No longer out of sight, out of mind. Here's another example of object permanence. Here we have a green train approaching the tunnel. The green train is going into the tunnel. The infant continues to look at where the green train was. Now, here comes a, a train outside of the tunnel. The infant was not predicting that it was going to come out there. It just continues to look where it was. Oh, hey, there's a train. And probably doesn't even recognize that the train has become blue. Whereas you or I, if that happened, we think we just saw a cool magic trick. So object permanence means that even if it's 
out of sight, it's still in mind. And we don't really see object permanence uh, achieved until eight months, perhaps a little bit earlier or a little bit later, according to Piaget. Okay, so how does this object permanence become achieved? Well, first off, uh, around uh, four to eight months, we start to see some object permanence if just part of the object is visible. That is, here's a shark. Uh, the infant has a schema for shark, that is, can kind of visualize it, if you will. And so if you partially cover it, enough of the shark can be visible to activate the entire schema, and the infant goes for it. Okay, so um, they can start to get that object permanence. But if it's totally covered, out of sight, out of mind. Now here is also another uh, interesting illustration of, of object permanence and when it's there and when it's not. If you have a, a set of mirrors to make multiple images of mom, well, if the infant is less than five months, oh, this is cool. One mom is great, three moms even better, right? Um, but after five months, they've kind of developed a theory, an understanding. Hey, there's just one mom. And if they see multiple moms, uh, that starts to distress them. In fact, they get greatly distressed uh, over the concept. So if you're an identical twin who's a mom, uh, keep that in mind when your, your sister shows up, right? Okay, substage four, coordination of secondary circular reactions. Um, at this point, the infant is uh, capable of interacting with the world around him or her with these uh, different uh, movements, knows that if this particular motor activity takes place, this will be the sensation and can repeat them. Well, substage four, now we coordinate multiple secondary circular reactions. Uh, so the infant uh, might know how to open and close a door to the cabinet, might know about banging the pot. So now we see a combination opening the door, cl climbing in, and playing with the pot. Right, and infants able to coordinate several of these schemas to obtain a goal. And so now at 8 to 12 months, we're starting to see behavior. It's not just starting off random, but is purposeful towards achieving a goal. And again, at uh, 8 months, we now have that object permanence. Okay, substage 5, deliberate learning, that's ages 12 to 18 months. At this point, uh, we have the young scientist, and of course, Piaget was a scientist, and so uh, he perhaps uh, took joy in imagining these young infants being scientists uh, like himself. And so look at this cute little guy uh, sitting here in the high chair, and uh, you know, imagine giving him spaghetti, right? And so he takes the spaghetti, and he drops and oh, falls to the floor, and that, that's pretty cool. So he takes a little bit more spaghetti, what happens if I throw it at the wall? <laughs> and it goes to the wall. Oh, wow. And, you know, what's the consequence of that? Well, hopefully mom and dad are rather calm and peaceful. Well, there could be some serious consequences, I suppose. But the infant's learning about the world and exploring it. And it's starting with some purposeful behavior. And then substage six, beginnings of symbolic thought. Now, uh, Piaget really sees the infant is able to symbolically think about things that are not immediately present. And so with the toys, um, they, they can, they're going to be similar to, to what they represent, and the child can use those uh, a, as a symbol for, for the real thing, if you will, and use things like uh, language to communicate. And of course, they've been doing this before, but I guess even more in a purposeful uh, manner. Okay, what are some um, critiques of Piaget? And there's a lot, but I'm just going to share some of them. Uh, first off, um, that first substage. You know, the first substage where Piaget saw it entirely as reflex driven and, and really didn't think of any learning as possible. Here, uh, our behaviorists uh, show us that learning can happen even within that first month of life. Uh, what they did is they um, worked with infants where they attached a device to the infant's head that would measure head movement. And then uh, they had a, 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 like a little audio speaker. And they assigned, they, they, they assigned infants to one or two conditions. And one condition, the infant got to hear something like mom's heartbeat uh, only when their head was entirely still. So, you know, the infant randomly moves his or her head, stops moving as her head, and there's mom's heartbeat. And over time, uh, because hearing mom's heartbeat is this reinforcing uh, event uh, to the uh, keeping the head still, these infants uh, learn to keep their heads very still. The other group of infants, if their head's still, nothing's happening. But if they randomly move their head, then they hear mom's heartbeat. And so for the second group, it looks like they're totally rocking out as they're moving their heads back and forth, showing that learning is possible even in that uh, first uh, month of life. Object permanence. 
Piaget uh, presented the idea that object permanence is not going to be taking place in that first uh, four months of life. And from four to eight months, it's just really starting. And around eight months to 12 months, you finally got it, right? Well, we're going to see the infants achieve it at an even earlier age. In this particular experiment, we have a piece of cardboard and a short carrot or a tall carrot. And, you know, the carrot goes uh, behind the uh, cardboard and comes out on the other end. And, you know, the infant uh, sees the carrot uh, and, and then the carrot appears on the other side. Okay. Uh, and a follow-up. We have a part of the cardboard that has been cut out along the top. So if the short carrot goes behind the cardboard and comes out in a small amount of time, maybe like two seconds, uh, well, you wouldn't have expected to see the small carrot behind the cardboard anyway. Uh, and you know, two seconds, the infant will kind of follow. If it's a tall carrot and it goes behind the cardboard and you don't see it in the middle and it comes out on the other end, you and I would say, well, obviously that's like a magic trick or someone's manipulating something. And what's interesting is when the infant sees the carrot go behind the cardboard, come out on the other side, and it didn't see it in the middle, the infant's eyes get all wide. They get all big. And that tells you that, hey, they're recognizing something unusual is going on, which means they have the cognitive ability to understand that when the carrot disappeared, it wasn't totally gone, that it was still in existence. And it surprised them that it came out on the other side without them seeing in the middle. So object permanence. Piaget presented as kind of an all or none thing. Either you had it or you didn't have it. But a different view is that we slowly develop this object permanence, that uh, as we get older, our ability to keep something in mind and not be distracted uh, is strengthened and, and grows. And, and that's basically where the, the literature uh, goes today. Rational abilities. Um, you know, ability to do math is a rational ability, and, and Piaget certainly didn't uh, think of the infants in the sensory motor stages as rational. In fact, um, not till much later does he really ascribe rational thinking to, to human development. So here's an interesting experiment that shows some of the simple ability to do math. We have a shoe box where um, one long side of the shoe box has been cut so it can go up or down, like stage curtains, if you will. And on uh, another end, there's a hole cut out where the researcher's arm can come in. So the simple uh, example of a rational ability is the ability to add 1 plus 1 equals 2. So the, inf so the researcher puts uh, a mouse into the cardboard um, shoe box. The little stage thing goes up, blocking out a view. The researcher puts in a second mouse behind the curtain, if you will, and the hand comes back empty. And if the screen drops and there's two mice, well, all right, that makes sense. And the infant looks at it, and no big surprise. But if the screen comes down and there's only one mouse, well, if you've been doing the math and you know that there should be two mice, you'd be surprised. And the infant's eyes widen, showing the infant is surprised. So the infant is able to do some of that basic, very basic math. But math, nonetheless, showing uh, some rational ability. Likewise with subtraction. If there's two mice and the researcher's, uh, and the curtain goes up, blocking the two mice from view, and the researcher's hand comes and removes one of the mice from the stage, and the stage drops down to reveal one mouse, no big deal. But if the screen comes down, revealing two mice, the eye, that Eyes the infant widen, showing the infant thought, hey, this is a surprise. I only expected one. All right, hope that you found uh, this uh, general overview of Piaget's sensory motor stage, as well as some of the critiques of it, uh, helpful.